Jane. My pronouns are he, him, his. I am the senior manager of programs here at Art New York. I am a white man in his mid thirties uh, with brown hair. I'm wearing uh, green glasses, uh, a, a dark blue sweater and a pink plaid shirt. And I'm sitting in my living room in front of a television and a teal wall. So thank you for being here. Uh, again, just a quick reminder, please remain on mute when you're not speaking. We are recording this panel, so if you would like to not be a part of that, be sure you're not a part of that recording, you can turn your camera off. Uh, but again, we are spotlighting both the speakers and interpreters for today's event. Uh, and so the recording will likely be just of those folks who are in the spotlight. Again, we'll have a uh, question and answer session later in the panel. If you would like to drop questions in the chat ahead of that time, you're certainly welcome to. Otherwise, when we get to the question and answer portion, I'll ask that you utilize the raise hand function to unmute yourself and ask questions at that time. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to take just a moment to offer up a land acknowledgement. I would like to take this time to acknowledge that wherever we are currently located on Turtle Island, otherwise known as North America, we are on occupied territory. I am coming to you from the land of Lenape in Northern Manhattan. Art New York's membership in the five boroughs of New York City operates on the unceded ancestral land of the Lenni Lenape, Wappinger, Canarsie, Rockaway, and Matinecock communities. I want to honor and celebrate all of these indigenous communities, their elders past and present, as well as future generations. I also want to take this time to acknowledge that after there was stolen land, there were stolen people. I want to honor the generations of displaced and enslaved people that built and continue to build the country that we occupy today. And since we are gathered today in the virtual space, let's also take a moment to consider the legacies of colonization embedded within the technologies, structures, and ways of thinking we use every day. We are using equipment and high-speed internet not available in many indigenous communities. Even the technologies that are central to much of the art that we make leave significant carbon footprints contributing to changing climates that disproportionately affect indigenous peoples worldwide. I invite you to join me in acknowledging all of this, as well as our shared responsibility to make a good of this time, and for each of us to consider our roles in reconciliation, decolonization, anti-racism, and allyship. So thank you for taking that moment with me. Also, uh, thank you to Adrian Wong of Spiderweb Show in Ontario, Canada, who is the author of the second piece of that acknowledgement, uh, specifically around gathering in virtual space which is very appropriate since we're here to talk about uh, arts education in the virtual space. Uh, so I'm going to ask our panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, tell us your name, your pronouns, the organization that you're with, what you do with that organization or multiple organizations uh, in some cases. Um, give us a, a brief visual description of yourself and also um, just a, a brief intro to the type of arts education programming that you're currently involved in. We'll certainly get into more detail later, uh, but we'll start off with a, a brief intro. So I will just go in the order that you are on my screen and ask that Kelly begin. Thank you, David. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's really an honor to be here on this panel with all of you. Um, my name is Kelly Donovan. My pronouns are she, hers. Um, I'm speaking from the stolen land of the Lenape and Canarsie people. I am the director of in-school programs for Arts Connection. Uh, I'm a white woman in my late 40s. I have dark brown wavy hair. Um, I'm wearing a blue turtleneck and a black sweater. And I'm sitting in my dining room um, in front of a black bookshelf and um, an art piece uh, that is a black and white line drawing. Um, <clears throat> so to tell you a little bit about Arts Connection, um, Arts Connection brings programs in dance, theater, music, visual arts, and media arts to public schools in all five boroughs of New York City. Uh, this year, our programs are remote and online with artists mostly teaching synchronously or live using uh, Zoom and Google Meets. We're focusing on live synchronous sessions that highlight social emotional learning and the authentic conversations that happen between artists and students. Um, to remain flexible and inclusive, our residencies sometimes include asynchronous or pre-recorded components. We have about 70 teaching artists working right now. Um, every lead artist, uh, lead teaching artist online works with an assistant artist who serves as uh, not only an arts assistant but also a technical assistant um, and um, 
I will say that unfortunately our workload did decrease this year by about a third. Um, usually um, arts connection programs are in about 120 partner schools throughout the city and so far this year we're in 78 schools um, which, which is actually a little bit higher than we originally anticipated. Um, I can say personally that I began working at Arts Connection as a dance teaching artist um, and then I became a program manager and started working administratively and my current role is to oversee um, the Arts Connection programs of schools throughout the city. So I will um, pass it on to the next person. Thanks Kelly. Uh, let's pass it on to Alex next. Hi everyone, my name is Alex Santiago Hidao, he, him and his, uh, or El, if you're speaking Spanish. Uh, I am coming to you from the land of the Lenape in what is known now as Morristown, New Jersey, um, even though I'm the director of education at New York Theatre Workshop in the East Village. Um, in education at New York Theatre Workshop, we work uh, in school-based programming and similarly to Arts Connection, we have been delivering remote learning uh, via Zoom or Google Meet with our roster of teaching artists at our partner schools. Um, we work predominantly in the drama classroom uh, at underserved um, schools in the city uh, that have a commitment to arts education but might not have all of the resources um, um, to provide uh, the level of arts instruction predominantly theater instruction that, that they desire with excellent teachers. Um, so we, we work with schools and we work in community engagement with community partners across the city. Um, and we also uh, do uh, uh, after school programming um, and intergenerational programming. And then um, also in the, the profile of the work that we do in education, we work um, in general with adult audiences as well. So we uh, have a host of virtual programming this year uh, and master classes for adults, inclusive of course of our master classes for young performers as well. So uh, this year has been a, a complete year of transition uh, taking some of the work that, of course, we did um, grounded in communities to sort of the virtual space um, as best as possible. And we started a number of programs as well to meet the need of students um, uh, that were facing challenges as well as in, in, in schools in terms of sort of uh, the creative process. So happy to talk about all of that programming when, when we get a chance. Oh, and I, I am a Puerto Rican uh, man in uh, uh, my 40s. Um, uh, uh, white complexion, um, and uh, I am wearing a blue and white cardigan, and I am in my apartment, and you might see in the background some artwork, some books, my television, and if I move slightly, you might see my bicycle hanging from the wall. Thanks, Alex. Uh, let's pass it next to Kim. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm really honored to be a part of this panel. I am Kim Greer Martinez, and I come to you from the Sawanoi indigenous land of the Bronx. And I am a dance teaching artist with Arts Connection. I am also the artistic director of the Rod Rogers Dance Company. I am a black female um, with black silverish color hair, in my mid fifties, I am wearing uh, brownish green colored top glasses, sitting in my living room in front of a mauve color uh, background wall. I work in a range of different programmings. One is a DYCD program, which is Department of Youth and Community Development. I, I am a teaching artist for Broadway Junior program, as well as the Delta program, which is developing English language literacy through the arts. Um, when we were working in schools, I was also a part of a digital Delta program, which is a spinoff of the Delta, but working through a digital uh, platform using, using dance art. I am, it's a number of things. Wow. I'm also <laughs> a teaching artist, teaching pod classes, right? The newest form thing that we all have discovered during this time and uh, a dance instructor now at the master's school through a dance intensive program. Um, I don't think I left anything out and um, yeah, I guess we'll talk a little bit more later. So thank you. 
Thanks, Kim. And last but not least, Paul. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's so nice to be in virtual space with you and to see familiar faces and, and new faces. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm Paul Brewster McGinley. I use he, him uh, pronoun series. I am the director of teaching and learning for Roundabout Theater Company, as well as the managing director of Trusty Sidekick Theater Company. Um, zooming in to you from the stolen land of the Lenape people in Harlem, New York now. Um, I'm a white man in my mid thirties. I have um, dark brown hair that's rapidly receding, uh, short uh, brown beard. I'm seated in front of a gray wall um, with a little bookcase and some um, like knickknacks, a jade plant and a painting of 45th Street um, Theater District that I miss so dearly. Um, the education at Roundabout team has been working um, for the last 11 months. 11 months, y'all. Hope you're taking care every single day um, <laughs> to continue to use theater to promote social equity through three core program areas, um, that being our career training programming, community partnerships, and teaching and learning. Um, Roundabout Theater Company typically produces um, original works and revivals of um, plays and musicals across five stages in Midtown Manhattan. Um, we've obviously been on pause like everybody else. Um, through our shutdown, the team has really been focusing on some core values of artistry, connection, community, and inclusivity um, to offer our remote and in some cases in-person learning uh, engagement for our students, our teachers, our patrons, across all of those program areas. Um, I oversee our teaching and learning programming, which is longstanding partnerships with students and educators across the five boroughs of New York City. And we have the goal of deepening student learning, enhancing teacher practice, using theater as a vehicle towards um, that learning. Um, we support students' social emotional learning and a positive school climate by leveraging our roundabout productions, a theatrical teaching pedagogy, industry exposure, and experiential theater projects. Um, so we've been doing a lot of remote residency work, live synchronous as people have been uh, describing, as well as uh, continuing the work of our roundabout youth ensemble and um, our professional development series with teachers um, promoting connection among educators as everybody pivots and navigates. Um, we are in the midst of launching some digital season offerings for roundabout stakeholders and providing wraparound engagement for those. And um, we partnered with the Department of Education for a remote arts learning partnership series, which is a um, essentially a series of 80 lesson plans and student facing slideshows with supplemental videos um, that focus on two units of study for students to um, engage with asynchronously. Um, and those are centering student um, participation and voice throughout that process with students taking on the roles of theatrical um, artists. Um, so thrilled to be with you all and we'll pass it back to David. Thank you. So since we're talking about arts education, we're going to talk specifically about arts education in the virtual digital space. Uh, but before we dive into that, I want to talk a little bit and hear from any of the panelists about why arts education is important, particularly now. Um, why do you feel that arts education is an important component of work? And I'll just, I'll pass it to, it looks like Alex is going to jump yeah, in. Yeah, I'm happy to jump in. Um, I mean, we could certainly go down the road of, a, of sort of talking about the, the, the many different ways in which arts education is essential to a well-rounded education and a complete education. But for the time we're in, one of the things that we discovered um, immediately when we started surveying um, our communities and the students that we were working with, and certainly our partner teachers, is that the minute schools went 
um, in New York City uh, to a sort of majority sort of remote setting, if you will, where teachers were all of a sudden given instruction via Google Meet or Hangouts and later on Zoom as sort of the privacy concerns were resolved for Zoom to a certain extent, is that the, the immediacy uh, of what theater is all about, which is sort of gathering together in space and collaborating in person was lost. Um, and the benefit of, of that um, human interaction was lost and was the thing that, that, that students and teachers were missing the most. Forget about unit plans, forget about curriculum or sequencing community and sort of being in space with each other was the thing that that folks were missing the most. Um, and so we sort of, we started to focus on how do we create a space for community um, to sort of flourish however it can with the challenges and constraints of the virtual space so that we can have certainly not theater, but adapt some of the qualities that we, we love in theater and we find, find necessary in theater to sort of grow again and sort of develop again. So we focus our attention on that and not that creating community um, and, um, and, and flexibility weren't goals of our education programming before, it's just that they became part of sort of the, of, of the forefront. So, um, one of the things that we did, you know, along with the work that we were doing to support teachers in the classroom remotely, synchronously, and sometimes asynchronously, um, we created a, a brand new program, literally for uh, youth all around the country, which we um, called the Youth Artistic Instigators, inspired by our instigator season at New York Theater Workshop. And just to give you a sense, if, if you don't know about our, our season this year at the workshop, we literally recruited 25 artists um, in our community of affiliated artists and literally gave them a little money and said, go away during the summer and dream uh, work that we could uh, present in this moment, uh, produce in this moment that is inspired by the moment that it is and is also responding to the moment. It could be digitally, it could be socially distanced if we're able to produce something that is socially distanced. You know, by this point, everything has been digital because of the state of the world. We, you know, we hope we would be at a different place, but here we are. Um, and so we created a program for youth all around the country um, that, that we're missing their theater classroom. We're missing putting on the play. We're missing the acting class. We're, we're missing the self-expression in the ways in which um, they were happening in schools. Not that some of that wasn't happening in schools, but we discovered pretty quickly that there were limitations. Uh, some schools uh, had students for 20 minutes uh, via Zoom. Others uh, had it for an hour. Others would see just students once a week. So the students were not getting the same sustaining art um, education that was important for them. Um, and so this program um, you know, that we started um, was about actually giving a space to young people, not only to um, learn and grow through the arts, but express themselves and respond also to the, the moment of isolation they, they were facing in the midst of COVID and all of the trauma that that was bringing on and all of the problems that that was bringing on. And of course, respond to uh, social justice issues and the and the racial reckoning that we were experiencing at the moment. So, so it, 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 arts education in this moment is an outlet um, against isolation, against the traumatic effects of the pandemic, and certainly um, the moment we find ourselves around um, um, social justice and racial equity. Um, yes, I would definitely second that and um, agree that the um, the interactive, um, collaborative community building aspect of the arts has been super important. Um, just thinking back to the spring when COVID happened, you know, some of our programs were canceled. The schools just didn't have capacity to continue. Uh, in some places, they were able to switch online. Um, one program stands out it was a theater program where it was a regular class and a theater club and the sessions the program ended in june um, but the students kept coming to the zoom like the zoom link was still active and the teaching artist happened to just check in and the kids were there and they were like we don't want this to end you know can we keep going we'll just keep meeting so we were like oh let's put in some extra sessions you know the kids are they keep coming um 
similar thing, there was a set design class uh, with an artist partnering with a teacher and the kids just kept meeting throughout the summer. Um, like it was, it just became like an art making space for them to work on art together, share ideas, talk about what was happening to them personally, current events. Um, so this need for like, you know, making art, expressing themselves, you know, interacting with each other um, just was sort of naturally happening. Um, so many times I've heard teachers at schools say, our kids really need this. Um, it's so important. Um, and I think another aspect to it um, is that um, it's a way for the arts can still be multi-sensory, um, even though we're online. And um, I've heard a lot of teachers at schools worry about their kids sitting in front of a computer. Uh, it can be kind of detached or not so personal. And I know that um, teaching artists are extremely creative people and amazing problem solvers and have been finding all of these really innovative, interesting, like who would have thought of that? creative ways to engage their kids uh, and to play with the Zoom screen, um, to have the kids express through their bodies, through their voice, through making something, through doing a scavenger hunt, through turning their cameras on and off, getting really close to the camera and going really far, turning things upside down, um, just really inventive stuff that gets the kids moving and, um, you know, using breakout rooms and interactive chats. Um, but that's been a pleasure to see. Um, and I think just the aspect of joy uh, that, that comes in arts education is something that um, I feel like people at schools are like really noticing it of like, wow, the, the kids are having fun. They are making stuff. They're interacting. They're thinking. They're, it's a joyful feeling. Like we really, they need that right now. Um, and, the, and then the other thing I would say is, um, you know, it's, it's just a chance to kind of be yourself, express who you are. Um, I know for uh, a lot of teens and Arts Connection teen programs, um, they're kind of following their interests, which um, social justice, uh, Black Lives Matter, um, anti-racism, that's really coming into like their conversations and the work that they're doing um, in programs. There's a Teens Curate Teens program where teens curate art made by other teens. Um, and they're they're organizing it around um, Black Lives Matter this year, um, but you know it's it's a platform for teens to like talk about what's important to them and to make it very visible and present as well. You mentioned the you know creative and innovative arts educators, so I'm going to go to one of our creative and innovative arts educators, Kim. Um, would you tell us a little bit about what? you feel is so important about arts education and, and thinking specifically about some of your experiences with students in the virtual space. Yes, and I would also like to add that my pronouns are she, her, hers. I think I missed that before. <laughs> I think I would just really echo Alex and Kelly tremendously. Um, I, you know, Kelly also spoke about some of the things that I know that has happened while I am in this virtual space with my young people. And it is, it has been, I, I know what it is that I have done when I was in person with them. And I really tried to take that same energy, take the same, the same concept, right? Because it's the same concept. And then we had to, to adapt it because when we fell into this situation, it happened so quickly, right? Trying to, to just uh, maneuver through all of what was put in front of us. But at the end of the day, I had to place myself second and really think about the young people that I was going to have to look at in these square boxes. And I and creating a socially just space so that each individual, each child can bring all of themselves to a space that is just now for us probably very new for them maybe not so right but in terms of having to do the work that we are now asking them to do of course is very new i think us education we know that it helps to shape and develop the entire child it gives them a voice that is uh it, it gives it to them in a creative way it helps to amplify their voice and i think in on the, in this platform it definitely allowed my young people to know that 
I am now really being seen and I'm being heard. The square boxes really helps all of that. And in lieu of that, the level of collaboration really changes. It, they're willing to be a part of and develop a community that is going to be a socially just community for all of them, for all of their peers, for the TAs also. And I have just tried to allow enough space in what it is that I am doing that my students are also informing me what it is that they need, right? Giving that to them. And, and if what I've designed for the day, if they decide that there's something else that they need to do, then we add that something else in because it's their session, right? We're, we're also teaching them how to be flexible in many different ways, uh, flexible in our thinking, flexible in our being, flexible in just being able to, to physically express ourselves and just lend our entire bodies to what it is that is happening with arts baking. I think um, there's so much that has happened in a positive way, the communication, process between the peers and the TAs. I think young people feel really safe to some extent um, in these square boxes. Most of the time when we're in dance, because I dance, and most of us do not think that is an easy uh, art form, but um, we had to really adapt to whatever it is that you see. And I try to teach that way even before Zoom and, and Google Meets, whatever you see is what it is going to be. So if I design and create something and if I do a movement that's five, six, ha, huh, right? And if somebody else does, then that's exactly what it is. We take it, we use it, and we bounce off of all of that. Just letting young people know that their voices are being heard. What do they have to say and what they are doing really matters bringing their authentic selves to the table and just working, helping them to, 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 to just maneuver around all of that, I think. Um, I'm sorry, I lost my thought a little bit. There was something else I wanted to say. And, totally I just, fine. Um, and like Kelly said, playing with, playing with different things and concepts, you know, I have a way of just, I get silly. I become silly. I like to laugh. I hope that at some point in our sessions, we're all laughing and cracking up just, just because. And I will let my students know, sometimes I feel vulnerable. And this is the reason why I'm feeling vulnerable. I'm not sure. Maybe you're going to help me through this process. Maybe what we are going to do is just going to allow me to just be able to be here with you at, in, in the best way that I can bring in my best self. And all of my sessions start out with, I want to hear from you. How are you doing today? How are you feeling? Before I can even say five, six, seven, eight, let's get this lesson going, right? I need to give them that space and that time because they want, again, to be heard. They want to, want to know that they are a part of, not being just a part of, but also a part of dictating what is going to come next, right? And where they really fit in the equation of all of this. So I think, um, we know arts education is important. We know it is. We know how it transforms not just us, but a young person, because a young person being given that opportunity to know that they are already a creative being, right? So now it's there for them to just take that and just move forward with it. Sometimes I think we feel like we're giving them something, but they come with something. We're just opening up, opening up that path so that they are in there to know oh, this is who I am. And this is who I am during these times as well. So, yeah. Kim, I really love what you're talking about uh, around flexibility. I think that's such a key component and something I've heard from, from the rest of you as well about how you had to be flexible with your, with your goals. And Alex talked about you know, deepening the goal of, of community. That was a, present, a goal that was present, but it's become deeper. Um, Paul, I wonder if there, is there anything happening at Roundabout where you've shifted any of the goals? Like when you had to move to virtual space, did the goals change at all for you? I think um, if the goals were significantly changing, we had to say, pause and say, are we equipped? Are we the right people to do that? Um, and I think that what as you were asking that, we've had a lot of discussions internally about our role as arts educators and, and not as therapists, not as 
Uh, we can use trauma-informed practices to the degree that we are trained in those. But as we are collectively navigating a traumatic experience, to not um, ever add on to our our programming or 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 puff up our programming in any sort of way that is not within the scope of our role as a cultural organization, making aesthetic pieces and and using um, arts as a as a tool towards curricular learning. Um, however, the intensified um, goals of holding space, showing up, um, the like everything that's been said, and part of why I love being part of this New York uh, City arts education community is that these three other panelists and so many that are on this call, I'm sure, have all been rowing together through this time and finding ways of connecting throughout and finding ways of, you know, exchanging just like we are today, some of the new practices that we're learning. But um, I think, you know, for, as, as you're asking specifically about goals that may have shifted, our Roundabout Youth Ensemble summer production um, happens virtually and this past summer. And, and the goals of that as a piece absolutely shifted because everybody was learning how to produce a virtual production across 20 something, um, well, no, in total it must've been 40 different computers that were operating to bring that piece together um, and share it out with an audience. And I think it more than like the goals shifting, it's been that, that the impact has shifted and the opportunity for future hybrids of this work or learnings from this time that can be brought into future versions of the program has been what we've really been taking note of. Um, and then for the goals, we just return back to like artistry, connection, inclusivity, and community. Um, and if, if those are our like litmus tests around what we're doing and why we're doing it, then it, then it works. And it's, it's been centering the students more than ever. It's been amplifying um, the call for justice and envisioning a more equitable and just future. And as a primarily white organization with a roster of a lot of white teaching artists, decentering our voices and doing our own personal work to not cause any harm in these spaces um, and repair harm when it inevitably happens. So I think that those are some of the thoughts that come to mind with what you asked, David. <laughs> That's great. Um, I'm interested to know if anybody else has some things, some lessons that they're learning that they think are going to continue post pandemic. Paul was talking about hybrid models, um, whether that's specific uh, aspects of your work or just lessons that you think you're gonna take with you. I'd love to know what you think is gonna continue on past the pandemic. I think we're, we're, we're thinking about that now. Um, you know, one of the, the good things, you know, about this moment, not to say that we've had, that this has been a good period, right? But, you know, um, all the pain and the grief and the suffering and the death and the unneeded uh, lack of response, right? Um, I think that what the virtual space has afforded us is an opportunity to connect people far beyond our borders, you know, sort of city borders and neighborhood borders. Uh, you know, self-imposed borders, you know, we've, we've been able to connect with young people from all around the country, um, not just in New York City. Um, and we know that New York City um, is uh, one of the most segregated cities in the country. Um, we have the most segregated school system in the country. Um, and uh, for young people to cross borders, leave their community, come to our theaters, it's, it's, it's often unfortunately um, you know, uh, has become a privilege, right? It is a privilege for some um, and not for everyone. And so um, we need to do a lot more work on that front. But one of the things that has been, one of the things that has been really beautiful about this moment is that we've been able to connect with many people that can't come to New York City or can be with us in person or where that would be much more difficult. And we've heard it already that as we continue into the future, there has to be space for some 
for more virtual education, virtual community gatherings, uh, virtual experiences, because I think it's going to be um, part of that equity conversation. Granted that we have all seen uh, very extreme equity issues when it comes to technology, which you mentioned when you talked um, about it in the land acknowledgement. Um, and we've seen it um, in terms of uh, the classroom work, right? Kids that um, don't have access, the internet is spotty. Um, and then, you know, um, you know, multiple people in the household, you know, attention issues, um, unwillingness to turn their cameras on as well for a host of reasons, right? Not that we're forcing folks to turn their cameras on, but there, there are many inequities in the midst of wonderful things that have also happened to connect with people. So uh, we need to continue that work, I think, in the future, at the same time that we tackle all of those inequ you know, inequities in, in, in our in-person work and just in general um, in, the, in, in, in the world. Um, I think as, as cultural organizations, we need to continue being more vocal about those inequities beyond education and art, just in communities in general. I think we're being called as, as, as institutions that uh, see themselves as public institutions, right? Um, providing a public service to a certain degree as nonprofit organizations. I mean, we're more vocal about the, the inequities that we're seeing in society, naming them and, and trying to sort of coalesce people to, to try to solve them. So I, I think, yes, I think we, I think virtual arts education is here uh, with us to stay for a while, pandemic or no pandemic. Kelly, you were nodding along. Do you, do you agree that that is something, is Arts Connection thinking about continuing virtual education in the future? Yeah, um, it, it definitely does. There is this feeling of things are not going to go back to the way that they were and that um, the pandemic and the closure of schools, social distancing, everything shutting down. Um, it was such an impactful change that there are repercussions that I'm not totally certain that I can predict, but it just feels like we're headed on a new course now. Um, and, you know, there are wonderful things and negative things built into that. Um, I don't know that, you know, I, I have a sense of like, you know, things aren't going to go back to normal. And I think there are elements and aspects to online teaching and learning that are really here to stay. And it's kind of moved the dial um, of like, even like the online presence of the organization has shifted and the capacity of all of the teaching artists and staff and how they're thinking about interacting with kids has shifted in a way that I do think um, has impacted the work that we'll be doing in the future. Um, you know, small things like the fact that we're now going into students' homes, um, there's this like direct connect connection into homes, families, community, um, oftentimes siblings and parents and grandparents participating, being part of the program. Um, whereas the old way, we were always in school buildings and, you know, there would be sharings and uh, families invited, but it was a different, it was a different way of interacting with students that um, really brings in a new element that has, you know, really wonderful implications in, in some respects. It feels like we're connecting with communities in, in, in a different way. Um, yeah, I, I guess um, I, I, I don't exactly know how it's all going to shake out, um, but it feels it feels like you know it is a new way forward. Um, you know, thinking about teaching artistry and how how that's a career, um, and people are really dedicated to it, but it's so fragile in, in, in a way as well. Um, and just how how hard the arts have been hit. Thinking of the teaching artists and that that work, it, it feels like there's a change there as well. And you know, how do we um, support this, this like uh, this, this role, this career um, that that people are dedicated to to keep it going? Um, all of the ad advocacy that was done by organizations like the um, Arts and Education Roundtable, um, really like all of the outreach to council members um, to say like, listen, you know, please don't cut the school budgets, uh, don't cut arts education. Um, it really needs to keep going. It's so vital to these communities. I feel like just how um, 
invested people were in that, it really had an impact. And that that also feels like it's put us on this new trajectory um, as, as a community or how people think about the role of arts education and communities and how all of that works. Um, so yeah, I, I feel like, uh, yeah, it almost feels like a wave of change that's bringing, you know, it's really shaking things up, um, bring, put, bringing us, yeah, it's, it's going to change things, I think. Um, but then there are some things that are like, well, this is the same, you know, um, like, uh, I know Arts Connection, we have a motto called uh, working and thinking like an artist. And that's, you know, our goal is always to get students working and thinking like artists. And whether we're in a building or online, um, you know, that that's what we're doing. Um, what Kim was saying before about how you know, it's not that we're giving the kids something, they're coming with something and we're creating a space to explore that and let them express it. You know, that things like that kind of remain the same, um, but how it happens changes. That's great. Um, Kim, I wonder if you had any experiences like Kelly was talking about, about sort of other, either other children in the household or other members of the family in the household participating in your classes in a different way? Is that something that you've experienced at all during this time? Yes, for sure. <laughs> um, I definitely wanted to chime off of that, uh, of what Kelly has said. And, and just there's this creation of community in terms of working with the young people that you know you have in your workshops. There's another level of creating this community because we have we have now entered into their homes, just as just as they have entered into ours. We've entered into their homes and there's so many different things that are going on and helping them to understand the balance, helping them to understand that it is okay because this is what the world has now given to us. And how are we going to push through those barriers to, to, to accept that, that the person on the other side is not going to judge us and we're not going to be judged. And to echo off of Alex, in terms of, you know, as arts organizations and as artists, I think we're going to continue doing this work via Zoom. Um, there's going to be a multi layers of it when we go back to whatever becomes that new norm and just really working on how are we going to push through the inequities of what it is that we've been living through for so, so many years, all of our lives? How are we going to continue to help our young people? And, you know, quite frankly, they're helping us, right? We, right? There, there, there's a, a little separation between the elders and, 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 and the youngers at heart, right? But how are we going to continue to see through of peeling off the layers of what has been devalued and dehumanized for so many years, right? Forever. And when I see their siblings in the background, when I see uh, an elder in the background, come on in and join us. And I invite them into the conversation, right? So they're not just there to move. They get invited into the conversation. They get invited to be a part of the creation. They get invited to say, oh, I have a movement I would like to try out. Let's all try this out, right? So there's a combination because I allow, um, I think, I feel like it was Alex who said that uh, they ended up having a program during the summer where you had young people and you gave them monies and you say, you go off and you create what you're going to create. Well, we didn't give them that, but what we gave them was in the moment during the sessions, you are, you are going to create just the same way, and, and your creation is going to be very differently than what my creation was. Do I get to tell you what to do? Absolutely not. Does anyone else get to tell you what to do? Absolutely not. Because whatever it is that you are feeling, whatever it is that you are thinking, whatever resonates with you at that moment, it can be something that happened on the news that you read. It can be an incident that happen with a family member. It can be something that is going on in your community that you want to create around and we're going to be, you're going to create that on us, right? So getting them to think like an artist, to become a, a critical thinkers and, and just to, and to be independent, right? And to take charge of their own learning. I think um, that has definitely strengthened. It was something that we were doing before. And I think it really strengthened during this time because our young people needed it. They needed it. They were asking for it. They were asking for it before. 
We didn't probably know that that's how they were asking for it, but this platform also gave it that too, I think. And it helped us all to recognize it. At least it did for me, for sure. I hope I answered your question. <laughs> and then some, thank you. Um, okay, let's, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn a bit of a corner here just to talk about some nuts and bolts. Uh, so we've talked a lot about the importance of arts education, we've talked about the flexibility and what I'm really hearing so much of and, and so appreciative of is the responsiveness of you as providers of education to the needs of the students um, and really seeking to serve them where they are and, and respecting what they bring to the table as well, which I really, really appreciate. So I just wanted to underscore that. Um, before I turn the corner to say, just some random nuts and bolts questions. What platforms do you use? And do you have a favorite? I've heard some Zoom, I've heard some Google Meet. You can just sort of popcorn around. What do you use? Flipgrid's been popular. Um, what was that again? Flipgrid. Okay. Um, video submissions that can be in response to prompts. It can be asynchronously done um, for folks to be in communication with each other. Um, I'll also pop in uh, Jamboard as part of Google Suite, which is like a whiteboard post-its. If you miss a, a good post-it pad in your arts education, it can kind of give you that feel. And um, we've utilized WeVideo a lot, um, which is an online collaborative video editing platform that's allowed folks to contribute to video, video editing from multiple spaces. Um, I'll, stop, I'll stop talking. I like the nuts and bolts techie stuff. Good. We'll get, we'll do more of that. Anybody else? What other platforms do you use? Well, definitely did all of that. Yeah. Yeah. Same Zoom and Google Meets are big. Um, I would add in Padlet. That's been a big one um, of, you know, like sharing and making comments or, you know, like a, a place where things can be posted and people can respond and add to it. Um, and uh, discipline specific um, Soundtrap. Uh, as, as like a music composing um, application that's that's pretty easy to work with um, and affinity which is um, sort of like uh, similar to like Adobe suite but um, not as expensive not as prohibitively expensive and I was just going to to add that that you know sort of in a, a traditional class as well we've sort of used you know Google, Docs and folders, and you know, for kids to upload um, anything that they're writing, um, and then of course, um, uh, you know, just stay in touch with us like that. And then for classes, um, we've used Google Slides as well. So if there's sort of some audiovisual components, or you're creating a presentation together. Um, the slides can also be interactive so that kids can add on to the PowerPoint slide presentation that a teaching artist might be using for a particular lesson to make it, um, you know, to offer multiple modalities. Um, so the great thing about Google Slides is that you can go into them and kids can very much like a Jamboard, which is also a Google product, uh, you know, put post-its and write notes and add images, um, all of that. I just thought of one more that's been big, which is stop motion. It's a it's a digital animation, stop motion animation app, and you can get a free version. And we've been able to get together like iPads and get them out to schools to send out to kids. Um, the lighting platform EOS um, has a free visualizer called Augmented that um, can allow for like virtual lighting cues to be created, which has been great for demos and also um, great for students to do their own lighting designs. Nice. I haven't used um, EOS, but, <laughs> but I'm, I'm liking that idea and concept. But of course, Zoom, the same Google Meet, YouTube, uh, creating video tutorials, Padlet, uh, Whiteboard on Zoom, Google Slides, uh, Google Docs, yeah. Um, for more for editing and um yeah a soundtrack because i work with a group of young people that is using soundtrack so i am where they're creating music we're using their music um in our dance classes and for creating choreography as well so yeah a combination of it all too i think 
the, the one thing that I wanted to add that we haven't necessarily used it within sort of a lesson, but it's at the forefront of every young person's mind right now. Um, and it's the usability of um, TikTok, for example. And so that kind of style has sort of seeped into our devising work, our theatrical work, um, sort of the short visual elements of it. So, so I think that has become part of the artistic vocabulary along with Instagram, but TikTok uh, and the memes and, you know, it's off the moment. So it's part of the aesthetic conversation without a doubt. Paul, I, I feel like TikTok really spoke to you. Do you want to expand on that? <laughs> I mean, everything's able to be a TikTok. We've had Ratatouille the musical on TikTok. So um, yes, I think that like Alex was saying, it absolutely feeds into the, the now of it. I remember several years ago, you know, using Boomerang as a way of teaching Tableau. Now TikTok has become such a way of, of integrating story structure, elements of spectacle and surprise. There's just so much uh, theatricality in that platform that can be mined for so much good. <laughs> and can and, I add to that? I mean, yeah, please. And I think that's so interesting because, you know, somehow I thought my students really were going to go for TikTok as well. And they love to speak about it. They love to talk about it, the fact that they look at it, and maybe they have even created some videos on their own, but never posted. But I really could not get them going into, into just using TikTok for our work. Um, they kind of sort of push away a little bit, but they really like it, but they, but they really have pushed away from it. So I think that's a, I thought that was really interesting. Um, yeah, considering you, TikTok is their thing. Do you yeah, think I would, that's I agree, yeah. I was just going to say that it's a sort of like a personal thing. Uh, it's like a personal connection for them. And so we haven't asked them to do a TikTok as part of the classroom, but uh, gather their ideas from their experiences within mm -hmm. that platform to sort of bring into the work that we're creating together rather than, than diverting their attention towards that. Because they feel like there's this div division between the personal and sort of the, the communal as part of the class. Sorry for interrupting, David, but I just wanted no, to- You, it you answered to exactly what I was gonna ask. So <laughs> go ahead, Paul. Yeah, you know, it just has to come from the group. Otherwise it's an assignment and then it's work and then we've stolen the joy of the platform. <laughs> Paul, do you want to, uh, you, you mentioned really loving the sort of tech aspect of things. Um, do you have any other thoughts you want to share about successes or challenges uh, related to tech? Sure. I think um, the, the Google Slides and, and Google Documents as the, the core um, of this large project we've just completed, this Remote Arts Learning Partnership, which I'll be sure to put a link in the chat because it's free curriculum that's available. Um, just te technological challenges around sharing permissions and um, access for different domains, getting to the nitty gritty of the back end of G Suite and what types of G Suite accounts can access different classrooms that are on Google. There's just a lot of nuance in um, permissions and in linking and embedding files so that they can be used. And then on our side to um, wanting to track analytics, there's been challenges around understanding what the views are. Um, I'm seeing a, a chat come into the um, platform here, streaming platforms or services that we've used, uh, streaming a Zoom meeting into a YouTube and vice versa. Um, yes. Um, <laughs> not always to the best of success. Uh, it takes a lot of rehearsal that we've had to do. Um, but Zoom connecting to YouTube Studio um, is what we typically are doing. When you're thinking about, you know, if someone were to develop a virtual arts education program, they haven't done it yet. How many people do you like to have in the virtual room? How many students is, do you feel is like the right amount, too many? Maybe your opinions will differ, that's totally fine. Well, well in, 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 in the classrooms with the teachers, you know, um, 
attendance varies. I mean, that's one of the other big challenges that teachers have experienced, of course. So we work with whoever shows up, you know, um, and it tends to be smaller numbers now. Um, you know, we worked in smaller schools to begin with, so class sizes sort of fluctuated and sort of hovered around the 25 student mark. Uh, but that has dwindled so uh, in the digital space. Um, so, you know, we work with anyone from, you know, 10 to 18 kids, 20 kids, it just depends, right? So there we have to be incredibly flexible. In terms of the programs that we control in terms of um, a little bit more in terms of, 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 of uh, uh, our, uh, we do our own recruitment for those programs. The Youth Artistic Instigators program had 25 students, um, which we knew was going to be a lot of students for the kind of work that we wanted to do. But our primary goal there was serving more students that um, um, that were not having access. So we uh, didn't try to, of course, um, not pay attention to the quality, of course, uh, of the interaction. But it is harder with with you know, and we actually had great attendance and ended up with 24 students, um, which was a total surprise. You know, we thought, oh, we we're going to have attrition without a doubt. Um, and that was not the case. Um, in our uh, intergenerational playwriting program, we have about uh, 14 participants. So that seems to be a sort of a better, um, you know, for the sort of more in-depth work, that seems to be a better number but of course you come up against the need and the wish to serve more more kids with the limited resources that you have um so I, there's not a you know it just depends on your curriculum what your goals are and what you're intending to do um, we're doing a series of master classes for youth um and we are capping those at 25 and our teaching artists are just doing you know hour-long workshops on voice on acting on you know shadow puppetry on i don't know choreography for musical theater song interpretation whatever that is and that is sort of focus on very specific techniques and some activities uh and we use breakout groups and and the like but um but they're designed to serve 25 students at the survey level if you're trying to do something that it's deeper, you know, 25 kids on a Zoom call, it's very difficult. I would agree with Alex on the 25 cap, because you, you want to try to, you know, include as many students as you can. Um, we're, we kind of work with uh, the classroom sizes that are the same for if you were in school. Um, which is often around like the high 20s into 30. But in general, I would say the classroom sizes are smaller this year because of the cohorts and the social distancing. Um, and just to go back a little bit into the challenges, that's that's been a real big one. Um, every school is like a puzzle to figure out, you know, who's, who's fully remote, who's sometimes in school, sometimes not. And there's cohorts A, B, C, and D. And you can't, you can put these kids together, but not these kids, you know, because they're home and they're in school, or sometimes the artist comes in onto a smart board. Um, some kids might be in the classroom and some kids might be at home. So that's like a challenge for the artist to figure out. Um, so lots of really like crazy challenges of, you know, our partner teachers having to like move the laptop around to show the kids in the classroom to the artists, um, you know, an after school program where you used, we used to bring all the kids into the auditorium, but now they have to stay separated out into classrooms. So you have these small classrooms with small groups of kids. So just very challenging that way. But, you know, we've been figuring it out. Um, um, I would say that one kind of game changer has been um, trying to always have a technical assistant or an artist assistant with the lead artist so that um, I know in the past where it might have just been a lead artist alone by themselves with the partner teacher. There's now a technical assistant who can manage the chat, uh, work one on one with a student having trouble, let kids in and out of this, uh, in and out of the session, um, you know, play a play a slide or music or, you know, assist by going into a breakout room. If the lead artists internet fails, they can take over the class. Um, so that's that's been sort of a, I think, a, a game changer that um, I would definitely recommend is like having that second artist in the room really has has helped a lot. 
I love that idea of the, the game changer. I think that's a, <laughs> that's a great framing to ask all of you, what are, what are your game changers? What are your like tips and tricks that you've learned up to this point that you thought, oh, well, that really, that really made my life much easier <laughs> in this space? I think um, I'll add, oh, go ahead, Kim. Oh, okay. Um, uh, I'll just say quickly that, um, you know, with all of the, the bells, whistles and tools and everything, the game changer is to, you know, focus on the human connection um, and to teach from within your own or my own technical proficiencies um, and to expect it to go gloriously wrong um so that it can you know change the next time so i think that that was a a game changer for for a lot of our artists who like to transform a classroom into a theatrical space the tools in which to do that in a virtual setting are so numerous and you know i think by now we may have all had that moment of the the window just leaves the screen and you don't know where it went um, but suddenly I thought I was teaching you and I have no idea if I'm just now alone in my bedroom again. <laughs> so um, teaching from within, uh, within the technical proficiency and, and shedding away some of the bells and whistles to get to the core of connection has been a game changer. Sorry, Kim. Thank you for that, Paul, because that's exactly, well, maybe not in those extreme words, but that's exactly what I would have said as well. Right, because there have been times where you're in the midst of teaching, and then all of a sudden you're looking at a screen and you're saying to yourself, Oh, well, where did everyone go? Right. And just just you know, just knowing that that space is so important and with the level of flexibility of of whatever is going to happen, it is going to happen. And we're we're gonna persevere. But we need to be able to just know that we are finagling. Oh, wait, I have to get this button. Oh, wait, I have to do this. And five, six, seven, eight, and I'm still trying to move while it's all happening and maneuvering. And, you know, like Kelly said, letting in a student that may have dropped out or someone else that has dropped out. And we all can miss it, even though you have an assistant and that's what they're doing. Something else is happening at that moment, too. Right. So it's just, yeah, it's just um, being there and being present in such a way that is um, that allows you to to do your art form, your art making as well, right? With with your students. So I think, yeah, I'm not sure about the tricks, but <laughs> yeah. I would say I would say that's a pretty solid tip for us in virtual space or in person. I <laughs> think that's a great uh, great tip for us, Kim. Um, great. So I'm gonna open it up for questions from the group. I see a few questions have come in in the chat, which I'll take a look at to start us off with. Um, but I just want to remind everyone, at this point, you're welcome to drop your questions in the chat, and we will go through them. You're also welcome to utilize the raise hand feature on Zoom if you'd like to raise your hand, and then I'll call on you, and you can unmute yourself to uh, ask your question live and in person. Well, live, <laughs> not necessarily in person. Um, OK, so I'm going to start with what I see here in the chat. Um, how do you recommend engaging with softwares like Adobe or Microsoft Office with school plans for educational programs within nonprofits? Well, <clears throat> I can speak to that. Um was just dealing with a situation where uh, students are doing digital animation and the artist really wanted them to work in After Effects, which is part of Creative Cloud, and to get some training in Photoshop. Um, we did look into like setting up an educational account, but we just didn't have the numbers. Like we didn't have the number, you know, like it, it seemed like those were set up for a specific school building. And I know when Arts Connection has worked with Adobe, it's usually been in a computer lab that a school already has set up. Um, so in that particular situation where it was a small program, we, we couldn't make the creative cloud licensing work. We just couldn't find the right setup for it. So we wound up going with Affinity, um, which was a little bit more flexible and had a lot of the same features 
Um, so that's that's like a very recent like how we figured out something. Um, but it, it, you know, it seems like the Adobe licensing, if you had like a substantial group of programs, you, you could maybe get that to work. Yeah, I would say that that um, we've been pri primarily using Google and schools have been primarily using sort of Google Docs, um, just because it's an opportunity, of course, as well to sort of do interactive and collaborative work on a single document, for example. Um, and, and in terms of sort of um, designing stuff, um, uh, sort of a uh, for sort of graphic design, for example, or anything like that, then web-based uh, uh, application like Canva, um, it's really uh, useful um, uh, rather than sort of, you know, multiple licenses of something that it's really expensive. That's great. Um, in the chat, Abby says, one of our challenges is finding a moment to side coach without derailing the full group. In person, you can use a whisper next to someone or pull someone aside. Um, but outside of a breakup room, a breakout room, sorry, we're finding this type of one-to-one -one support much harder. Would love any creative solutions you've found for this. I know that over the oh, Kim, did you want to go? But let's, let's start with. Uh, I see lots of people, so let's go. Kelly, Kim, then Paul, all on this this subject. Um, I'm thinking of things that that I have seen or heard about artists doing. Um, one of them is um, having a side conversation and and sometimes it might be like an assistant or another adult in the room while the lead artist is teaching, maybe having a side conversation with a student in the chat um, or possibly over a text or phone if that's possible. Um, and I know that um, one of our teaching artists did some pilot classes over the summer with uh, it was young children and it was a large class like 20 25 students and she asked her assistant she said will you scan all of the kids faces and see how they look like what are their expressions like and if someone seems like they're not sure or you feel like they're a little anxious or nervous or worried will you text me or chat me their name and i'll make sure to give them some attention um, and I thought that was a pretty interesting, like behind the scenes, the the art, the adults in the room were kind of like just being aware of like, you know, oh, I've noticed that so and so, um, you know, isn't sharing their camera. Can we maybe try to talk to them and see what's going on today? Um, that that kind of thing. Yeah, I think I would just echo off of Kelly at this point, uh, just trying to find different ways of of recognizing and noticing when you have a student that either needs that um, needs that attention and how you're going to give it to them. So putting a plan in place probably in, in um, beforehand so that your assistant or whomever else you're working with will know what to look for and how to even spot you and you can spot them and cue each other as to uh, a, a student or a child that might need extra help or just a chat with, uh, of course, a breakout room. I've had success in that in realizing that a student is, is hesitant to participate and say to them, do you want to join me? Yes. And then right away, we just go and just, you know, just trying to, to be on top of it, to move faster than usual to some extent. And sometimes it works and Sometimes it does what it does, you know, but just finding different ways, I think. I don't think any way is the best way, just finding different ways, multiple ways. I agree with so much of what's been said. And um, I think I'm so glad this has been brought up because this is such a high focus platform on Zoom and that there's, there's no hiding when you have the yellow, um, <laughs> bounding box around your rectangle. And that's that's really a big risk for anybody to take. Um, and the visual feedback or the connection can get really lost. Um, I find that even just personally, I love the hide self view feature because I can't look at myself anymore and it relieves a lot of that pressure. Um, but I think the only things I'll add to this are you know private chat, as an additional whisper method, um, but making sure that the 
chat is also being saved so that we have the record of all of that um, correspondence in case there was ever any issue. Um, and the idea of um, office hours or, or like built into the plan, the, the idea for side coaching or one-on-one one, one -on -one being available, which means more facilitators sometimes, smaller breakout rooms, um, and asynchronous um, submission or sharing with more formative assessment in that other space. I'm thinking Flipgrid in particular um, can be a, a bit more of a back and forth that isn't within the time of a workshop, but is over the course of a project. Thank you. Uh, also from the chat, I think we as artists, teachers, and organizations are eager to continue our virtual work even when most in-person opportunities resume. Do you think our schools, students, and community organizations in New York City and around the world are as well? So we want to keep doing it. Do you think they want us to? Um, I, hope, I hope so. Uh, um, I think that this speaks to what I was sort of talking about before that I think we are at this moment where we're really considering what the future is going to be and try to prepare for the future. The one thing I would say is that we were completely unprepared for it. Um, just to keep it real, um, you know, organizations have different budgets, but I could assure that most of us didn't have a line for technology, <laughs> uh, for virtual arts education, for creating content just did not exist. Um, we were ill-prepared. And, and in fact, I don't think foundations were encouraging arts education departments to do you know, any kind of fundraising or supporting what it is, frankly, um, to create quality content as well and, 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 and all, have all, all sort of the technical tools and all the professional development, quite an expensive proposition, right? Uh, to do it at scale and to do it in depth. And so, I hope that we will continue to do it for the, the, uh, the equity reasons that I was sort of talking about before, but there needs to be, in all honesty, um, advocacy, uh, and I think foundations are listening, right, in the, in the philanthropic community for some flexibility and some support to grow resources, technical resources for arts education organizations and cultural organizations to do this work equitably. And of course, we already know that that needs to happen in schools when it comes to technology as well. Um, um, so yes, and you know, it, there, there has to be some resources supporting that for institutions and without a doubt for schools. Thanks, Alex. Uh, I see Jessica has a hand raised. Jessica, if you would like to unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, yeah, thank you. Thanks, panelists. Um, something that Kim was talking about inspired a question in me. Um, I'm currently teaching at the BFA level. And there's been a lot of talk about how there's a, a sense of safety that can happen when the students are in their own spaces. Like um, but something that I have found too is there's a safety different. that can happen within the studio. And um, I'm encountering um, trying to figure out how to create a sense of safety and vulnerability for students that are really sharing a lot, um, putting, you know, exploring and maybe sharing vulnerable feelings in the context of, you know, I'm teaching viewpoints and movement right now and, and this comes up. And um, I have found that in a way, um, even though their room is very safe, there's a kind of, I don't like to leave, I, I, I worry sometimes that they're left hanging a little bit. Um, and I've, and I've, I've learned that my way of um, providing um, safety and holding space is, a, is, is quite nonverbal and, um, and is sort of a way that we can all be in presence and breathe together and just um, and show active listening. And so I would, I would um, just be really curious to hear anyone's experiences with that um, uh, and, um, and how to navigate that space that we're in. I have a couple of ideas and I'm, I'm sure you're doing some of this already in terms of sort of group agreements, but in my, in my own work, um, I, I, there are two 
important things that we do, which of course are always part of any sort of teaching artist, you know, sort of toolkit, um, which is rituals, beginning rituals and closing rituals. Um, and that those have always been important, but in person, sometimes students, you know, don't like to keep up with them until they sort of warm up with them. Uh, you know, when, this is working with young people, um, younger people. Um, so, but in this virtual space, rituals at the beginning um, and at the end that are sort of facilitated, not just by the instructor, but by everyone uh, have been sent very centering. Um, meditation and breathing exercises more so than ever before for focusing. And then something that I do in, in my work, uh, you know, outside of the context of New York Theater Workshop, but in general, when in sort of my, some of my applied theater work, um, uh, I, which is pretty emotional. And, and by the way, I forgot to mention that I'm, I'm also a college professor. I teach in the program in educational theater at NYU and also teach at Tisch at NYU um, undergraduates. So I experience all of this in the studio setting as well. Um, and um, one of the things that I talk about in facilitated work that is highly personal is that I always ask students to, to really sort of reflect on the stories that they share and why they share them in a space. Um, and I always encourage folks to share scars not wounds into the space, right? So to share stories that they, and of course they're welcome to share whatever they want to share, but, but certainly that they reflect on why is it that they're sharing something and hopefully that they're sharing something because they've, had, they've done some amount of processing uh, uh, and uh, encourage them not to share something that it's too open, that it's too immediate because we might not have the time to literally process that in the class and we don't wanna leave them hanging. If throughout the course of the class they they sort of you know feel like they're processing stuff more, that then they're welcome to share the work. Um, and then of course you know to 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 take what they learn, but of course confidentiality is at the core of anything that we do when it comes to um, uh, uh, personal work or work that it's inspired by the personal. Of course, this is less applicable. In, in a K through 12 context, right? Because we are reporters. Um, and if there's a kid that, you know, is presenting sort of suicidal behavior or suicidal thoughts, those private messages, those taken aside, those communications are central in the moment and beyond that moment. Um, I would argue the same thing happens with you're working with BFA students and adults, but certainly uh, they have the capacity to, to, to be more reflective about the things that they're sharing and why they're sharing them. And then of course, to, to prevent, uh, to maintain confidentiality. I'm sure you're doing all of this, but uh, just a couple of thoughts that came to mind. Anybody else have thoughts on that question? Just add briefly that I, I have learned a lot about my own practice through this time and how much, I think Jessica, what you said about nonverbal communication, um, you know, a, a look of connection with a student or um, a participant in a space can be so affirming and is so hard in this. Um, so I think I'd just say like technology as a tool moving forward is something I'm really excited about, but technology as a space um, only in certain contexts. And I'm, I'm excited to um, re-enter performance spaces and live performance spaces as such. And like, I, I dream of that day that we will safely all take a collective breath standing in a circle. Uh, <laughs> that, that, but there's a long way in my own view of this, there's a long road to get there for so many different reasons. And so finding the, I think we found the ways of triaging and Alex, I so appreciated that you were talking about how ill-equipped, <laughs> transparently, like how ill-equipped some of us were with this um, and how we've all had to pivot. And to Kim, hear your, the ways in which you've engaged students, it's, it's magic, it's continued magic that's happening in these spaces, but it doesn't have to be our default and we don't have to be excited about it. And I am so excited about that collective ephemeral experience that can can come back and the idea of third space or like an after school space where 
students are trying on new identities where they're not going to necessarily be overheard by somebody else where they aren't in their school setting but can a lot of our after school programs provided that sort of space for trying on new ways of engaging and, and creating social identities in different spaces and I'm so excited for that physical space to be available to our students again. I totally agree with, with, with what everyone is saying and I would add on to this idea of routines and rituals. Um, how the class starts and how the class ends and thinking about nonverbal communication, um, especially the endings. I know back in the spring, this was a meeting with adults. It was like a three hour day of workshops, PD meetings, and it was maybe about 70 to 100 people. And I think it, you know, it ended at 12 o'clock and it kind of just ended. And someone uh, wrote in some feedback that was like, I just had this, you know, collaborative experience for three hours with all these different people and then it just ended and I was alone in my space in the dark and it felt terrible <laughs> you know and at that moment I was like oh my goodness like having like a just just put some thought into how you end you know uh, to prepare people for that transition um, and kids as well and I've heard early childhood people say that in Google Meet um, the teacher can't end the session so the teacher can leave but the kids might still be there um so definitely like the the choreography of how that happens uh, you know like having like a physical moment or gesture that signifies that we're ending and uh, now you can move on and make the transition to the next thing um, but those have been you know important to think about that's great thank you um, we have one more question I want to get to in the chat really briefly before we wrap up. Um, and that is, does anyone have any ideas, tips, or tricks about when the teacher may be digital, virtual, but the students may be a combination of virtual and in the classroom? Um, we have had some experience with that. Um, we're making it work, but it's quite challenging. Um, the kids, even the kids in the classroom have to be socially distanced. So it's very difficult to get a camera angle where the teaching artist can see all of them. Um, so, you know, it, it's one of those things that it does happen. And I don't know that I have a great, um, having a really wonderful, patient, flexible um, teacher, adult um, partner in the room <laughs> has been really helpful. Um, but, you know, as a teaching artist, I think you're at home. Uh, there are some kids at home and you see them in squares and then you have a square for the big group and you have your partner kind of moving a laptop around. Um, in some cases, if you can get two laptops in that room, I think there was one situation where the, there was a laptop um, and it had, you know, plastic in front of it and the kids would come and speak into the computer in front of the plastic and that was a way to like do some one on one exchange with the kids in the room. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it's 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 a it's been a challenging situation that blended room. Yeah, I I mean just to chime off of that a little bit too, just in terms of my experience of having a combination. I'm currently teaching a group where more than half of them are in school and a quarter of them are at home. So really being trying to figure out how to notice each and every student during the process and as kelly stated they might come up close to the camera or you might have to just figure out how you're going to interact with them and i just try different things every other number squat blah 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 every other number stand up and you know and just so that they notice that they are or feel like they're being given that opportunity to be seen as well and 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 heard right through movement and just i use a I use two screens sometimes and sometimes three. And I'm looking at all of these screens because I need to be able to see the images larger than what I am seeing on my computer. So it's just it's just finding ways, just finding ways. And sometimes it works really well. You leave and you say, whoa, that was great. Sometimes you say, okay, that was really challenging, but what are we going to do the next time? And yeah, just leave room for modification, I think. And patience, patience and patience. <laughs> Patience is key. Um, thank you. We are almost out of time in our last just few seconds. I want to ask each of you to give us 
a closing thought. It could be something you um, are really proud of, something you're excited for, something that gives you hope. Uh, let's start with Paul. Mm. I think uh, right on the spot that the there is hope in the coming months. Um, the coming months give me hope that we can get to reopening in a safe way that um, yeah, that that can bring us back together physically. Thank you. Let's go to Kelly. Um, <clears throat> let's see. The words that I've been hearing all of you talk about so eloquently, community, uh, student voice, um, an, an image that came to mind, uh, a teaching artist was in his garage in upstate New York, teaching a class of kids in New York City. Um, and he was in his garage so they could see his garage and they just would call out like, oh, go pick up the boat. And he just made up this crazy story about being in a boat on the ocean with some you know, monsters and I don't know, the kids made up the story. They kept asking him to go through his garage and grab different things. Um, but it just seemed like, wow, like that would never be possible the old way we used to do things. Like they just made up this insane story and you know, <laughs> the artist acted it out in his garage with all of these props. And I don't know, it just seemed so innovative and inspired and the kids were so, you know, laughing and yelling out things. And like, it was just such like a joyous occasion. So um, just knowing that, you know, we're still finding joy and creativity and innovation and working together. Um, yeah, that would be my Thank question. you, Kelly. Mm -hmm. Alex. Um, well, I'm going to express pride in a sense, uh, March, April, I think May, we, we, we I don't think we, could have envisioned that we would sort of pivot, which is the word of the year, right? Um, <laughs> and and um, sort of show our resiliency and and try new things and be flexible. You know, so much of our work had been, well, this is the way we do it, and of course, there's flexibility within it, and and in a, a student centered approach. But um, it was a completely new way of doing things, and um, and you know, a year has gone by. And now I'm sort of in amazement of the many, many things that we have done when we stop thinking about, well, there is the one way to do it. And instead we said, well, we're just going to try it. Um, and also we're going to re, um, rearrange our resources, right? So the money was going to go for that, but now it's not going to go for that. It's going to go for this new thing that is going to meet the moment. Um, and I'm, I'm proud that we got over ourselves and said, well, let's just get to work and let's just do it differently. Um, and that has been really, really wonderful. Um, so yeah, I think we should all feel proud of ourselves. And in the midst of really difficult personal and communal experiences, we've been resilient and you know done what artists do, which is invent and imagine in the midst of adversity. So let's keep doing it. Couldn't agree more. Kim, you get to finish us off. What are your thoughts? Okay, thank you. I, I just think that, yes, we are, we are going to continue the work that we are doing with what and how we are presented it. I think it's just going to happen on whatever platform, whatever the space is, because we need to. I think it's important. It gives me hope to know, and it's fulfilling to me to know that young people and the people that we are touching the lives of will recognize the value and power of using their imaginations to take risks and make artistic choices. And that at the end of the day, we know that we are persevering. We know our young people are persevering through so many barriers and stigmas. And yeah, and we're going to, we're going to power through. We're going to power through. Thank you. And thanks to Kelly, Alex, Paul, and Kim, our fantastic interpreters. Thank you all so much for attending uh, today's roundtable discussion. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Have a good rest of your day.